Hello everybody, welcome back to Crusade Against Ignorance. Today we're going to be talking about philosophy and abortion, a very controversial topic. So I figured it'd be good to have a video kind of making an introduction to thinking critically about this topic and what philosophers say and think about it, some of the arguments, just so you're aware of the general landscape if you aren't already. So this is going to be an introduction to abortion, which is a very hot topic in applied bioethics right now. So the source text for this video is a book called Thinking Critically About Abortion by Nathan Nobis and Christina Grob. Grob, I don't know how to pronounce that one still. <laughs> uh, I actually have a review of this book up on my channel in the channel archives, so I'll link it in the description if you want to see my overall review of the book. Obviously, it's positive because I'm basically making a whole video version of it. Um, you can find the whole thing free online in PDF form, which I'll also provide a link to in the description, so give it a read. But it's only about $5 on Amazon, so if you'd like to support the authors and their project and making this information accessible, I'd encourage you to buy a physical copy of it as well. It's a great book, great little read, introduction to the topic. So hopefully th this video gives you a good introduction, but you should also read the book. So without further ado, let's get right into it. So let's just introduce the topic and kind of give the outline of how the video slash book is laid out. So there is a, it's very important to separate the moral and legal issues surrounding abortion. So, and it's, it is a very prominent issue in both these fields. So it's good to talk about both of them because you could consistently believe that abortion is, is wrong or immoral and that it should be legal for whatever reasons. That's a position that's perfectly fine to take. I guess conceivably you could hold that it is not wrong but should be illegal. I'm not quite sure how that case would go, but it seems at least possible, uh, albeit maybe not consistent in some senses. But just to point out, there are differences when we're talking about the morality versus the legality of abortion. So generally speaking, in the United States, abortion is now legal, but there is still a large group of people that think it is immoral or that it's seriously wrong enough to where that it should be illegal. So some states, specifically in the Bible Belt, in the South, um, or even as far as Texas, you know, even Georgia, Alabama have passed some more, uh, more anti-abortion laws. So it's kind of a generally interesting legal matter right now. And so there are some questions we have to sort out, uh, particularly are abortions wrong? And if so, are all abortions wrong or just some of them? Or is there a point at which some abortions are wrong, but they get to a, a point where they're, they are, but they weren't previously? Even if abortions are wrong, should they be illegal? Maybe we think they're wrong, but for certain economic reasons, they should still be legal and accessible so that people don't maybe do, you know, back back alley abortions. Um, so we can think of another instances of, of harm that are not illegal. So, you know, you can harm people in some ways or wish harm upon them in, in instances that are not illegal. But there are obviously some serious wrongs that should be illegal. So just it's important to take note of the moral and legal complexity at play here. Uh, we're going to be mostly talking in this video about the moral side of abortion, but the legal side is also interesting to look at. So here's how the outline of this video is generally going to go. I'm laying it out pretty much the same as how the book lays it out. So just a note here at the beginning, I'm not going to include everything, every single thing in the book. Uh, there are a couple arguments or points that they'll bring up or there are things they'll say about those that I'm leaving out not because I disagree with them or think they're bad, just for A, for time concerns, and B, I want to just give you kind of the big picture here, and I still want, you should still read the book to get kind of the uh, the more clear, rigorous, and laid out argumentation. So just as a side note, this is not going to be exactly the same as the book. There'll be some things I say that aren't in the book and, and vice versa, but the outline is generally going to be the same. So we're going to start off with defining abortion, how it should even be defined. Then we're going to go on to facts about fetuses, so some scientific facts that are relevant. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit then about some bad arguments on both sides, some better arguments on both sides, and we're going to wrap things up. Uh, that sounds brief, but don't worry, there's a lot in there. <laughs> it's going to be a pretty long video, or at least substantially long. Um, so as I, as I just mentioned a second ago, just a note to anybody viewing this, it would be, of course, useful to supplement watching this video by reading the book it's based on, the Nobis and Grove book. Um, again, it's going to be in the description. It's completely free PDF online. It should only take you about two hours or so to read. It's like 50 pages. It's very brief, very good. has lots of um, suggestions for further reading in there, and I'll give some at the end of the video as well. Um, so I'll provide a link in the description, as I said. Uh, you should definitely give it a look. Help. Sometimes it's helpful to watch a video kind of summarizing some, uh, general arguments from a book and then read the book because you go in with you know um, a better understanding, so you can sometimes get more out of a text. So I would encourage you to, after this video, if it piques your interest, uh, also to read the book, and then maybe kind of if you want to research this more, look into some of the sources that the book suggests and that I'll suggest later in the video. So 
let's go first here into defining abortion. So we're talking a lot here about abortion. Is it wrong? Is it right? What is it? Um, what, you know, should it be legal? It should it be legal or illegal? Uh, so the pro there is a problem with just defining abortion. Sometimes people give bad definitions or what definitions that are better or worse than others. So let's just go through two bad definitions and then one that seems pretty accurate. So the first definition that's bad is just to say that abortion is murder. Sometimes people will come right out the gate and say this. So as you can see, I've written here, uh, there are a lot of problems with this. Among other problems, it's just really uh, an unhelpful, unhelpful definition due to its just kind of question-begging nature. It assumes that abortion is wrong because murder is something that is wrong. So if we're identifying abortion with murder, we're already starting at the outset assuming it's wrong. So we're not going to have much productive moral discourse if we just assume that the action we're talking about is wrong. So calling it murder is not really going to be that helpful, at least as a definition. Obviously, if we go on to a posterior, I establish that it's wrong. Maybe you could say this, but as a definition itself, this is going to be unhelpful and in many senses inaccurate. So that's a bad definition. Second bad definition is uh, not great, but for different reasons, just calling it a termination of a pregnancy. So this is inadequate, doesn't tell us the kind of uh, the actual more precise nature of what's going on here it doesn't really inform us to what abortion actually is. And it also kind of leaves room for like accidental terminations of pregnancy. Obviously, if ter pregnancy is terminated in something like a car crash, that's not exactly what we're talking about. So the proposed accurate definition that the book gives, uh, particularly on page 10 of the book, is that abortion is the intentional killing of a fetus to end a pregnancy. So this is a good definition. Why is this a good definition? Because it's clear, it's precise, it tells, and it doesn't build any moral intuitions in at all or moral uh, assumptions. So intentional, that brings in the intentionality. So we leave out any kind of spontaneous abortions like in the second definition and killing. Killing is good because it's precise. It's telling us exactly what's going on, but it's not question begging. It's not assuming wrongness because it's not always wrong to kill things. So that's a morally neutral term of a fetus to end a pregnancy. So this tells us about the intention specifically where, you know, abortion is intentionally killing a fetus to end a pregnancy. That's what an abortion is. And it, this, this definition doesn't say anything about whether it's right or wrong, and it gives us a very clear picture. So moving forward, this is the definition we're going to be using. When we say abortion, we mean the intentional killing of a fetus uh, with the intent of ending a pregnancy. So with that in mind, let's look at some arguments. Well, actually, first, we're going to be looking at some facts. So we're going to hear, we're going to get scientific and talk about some facts about fetuses. So why is this important to talk about? Well, consciousness seems to be a pretty morally relevant property, and it's also a sharp property, which means there are no fringe cases of consciousness. Something is either conscious or it is not. There are no senses in which something is partially conscious. Uh, consciousness also seems to be a necessary condition for personhood, or at least for having certain meaningful experiences, sensations, and the ability to be harmed, uh, at least how we usually think about it. So it seems like consciousness is going to be very relevant to building a case for personhood. If you don't think so, well, I would uh, I suggest trying to think of some example of a person that isn't conscious. I don't think it's possible. This is obviously a scientifically and philosophically relevant concept. Also, consciousness is necessary for the ability to be harmed. So things that are not conscious can't be harmed in a meaningful sense. So unless you're uh, some sort of panpsychist or cosmopsychist, you're not going to think that rocks or just you know tissues or brain dead bodies or corpses uh, have or you know have consciousness in a meaningful sense. You can't harm a rock. If you throw a rock at another rock, neither rock is going to be harmed. So things seem to have to have, you know, some level of consciousness to be harmed. So again, unless you want to bite the bullet on panpsychism, you're going to have to say that things, you know, these things are not wrong to harm. And even then you're conceding the premise that things have to be conscious to be harmed in a meaningful sense. So it seems like our best science tells us that embryos and fetuses are not conscious, at least at the moment of conception, uh, be like an embryo. Our best science suggests that the earliest consciousness emergence emerges is after the first trimester. So pregnancies are split into three trimesters. Uh, an average pregnancy is about nine months long. So the, uh, the trimesters are three month period. So the first trimester is the first three months of pregnancy. The second trimester is the next three and then so on and so forth. So conscience doesn't emerge at least till about three or four months into a pregnancy. So I have a couple sources here. If you want to look at the U.S. National Library of Medicine, you can go to pubmed.gov, search under fetal pain, fetal consciousness, and get some of the scientific studies and papers uh, from embryology and neurology and all this. There's also a really good, I didn't include it here in the notes or in the resources at the end, so I'm sorry, but there is a podcast called Science Versus that has a really good episode on fetal pain, fetal consciousness, and they actually argue that fetal consciousness probably doesn't emerge in a meaningful sense until the third trimester, which is actually a pretty well-supported scientific view. But for the purposes here, we can just say that consciousness definitely doesn't really emerge, at least doesn't seem like it, at least three or four months into a pregnancy. 
So why is this relevant? Well, the next question is, when do most abortions occur? Well, very early on in the pregnancy for most of them. About 90% of abortions occur in the first three months. So this is the first trimester of pregnancy. So given what we already know about consciousness and our best science, uh, it seems that abortions, at least most of them, about 90%, don't affect conscious beings. So some more um, sources on this, that macro.org and the CDC, the United States Center for Disease Control website, has some of the um, statistics up for abortion. There are other sites for this too. So it's pretty accessible information online, Scientific American, uh, as well as others. So we know then that most abortions don't actually affect a being that is has consciousness as a property in a meaningful sense, at least as far as we can tell. Uh, why do most abortions occur is also an interesting question. So roughly 75% of women who get abortions are from poor, low income, and they often cite economically related reasons for having abortions. So either they're going to school, working, too much stress, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there are gut macro studies on this as well, so I'd encourage looking those up. For more. And then there's also an article called Abortion on the Left by Current Affairs Magazine that's readily available online that goes through some of this information and the statistics as well. So with some facts in mind, now we turn to some of the arguments. Let's start off with some question-begging arguments. So there are question-begging arguments, arguments that assume the truth of the conclusion, both for and against abortion. So starting with against abortion arguments, the first is that abortion is murder. Uh, this is obviously question-begging because, again, it assumes that it's wrong because, you know, if you're going to say that abortion is murder, therefore abortion is wrong, well, it's question begging. Wrongness is built into the definition of murder. Uh, abortion is killing babies. Adoption is a better option. Women have to live with their decisions, etc. cetera. Uh, the book has seven examples, and the women decision is actually my edition, which we're going to cover in a later section. Um, the book lists about seven. We could list more examples of this, but they all kind of, these kind of give us an idea of the general line of reply and categories. They all assume that abortions are morally wrong in some sense. So killing babies is also just kind of trying to appeal to some moral intuition we have that killing infants is wrong. And of course it is, but there are morally, you know, the pro-choice advocate is arguing about morally relevant differences between babies and fetuses. So, and I'll also saying like adoption is a better option. Again, why take that option if uh, abortion is, is not wrong? So a lot of these kinds of things assume it's wrong, which is not where we want to start. And there are also question begging arguments for abortion, saying that it's a personal choice. Women have the right to do whatever they want with their bodies. If you don't like abortions, don't have them anti-abortion advocates just want to control women. So these arguments also similarly just beg the question. They assume that abortion is not seriously wrong. Obviously, if abortion is seriously wrong, then saying that it's a personal choice doesn't make it not seriously wrong. There are limits to bodily autonomy. And we will cover kind of the, the women have the right to ever they do whatever they want with their bodies later. But generally, all these kind of lines of reply just kind of assume the conclusion. So all of these arguments here, and you can kind of think of ones along these lines that you may have heard or can just conceive of that are obviously similarly going to be question begging. So let's go into some everyday arguments against abortion, ones you'll just hear kind of around every day and in common spheres online and with people you're talking to that are not very good. So I start with this one saying just abortion ends a life. So one thing a lot of pro-life advocates online want to tell you is that they'll send you these you know, sources that, you know, every textbook says that life begins at conception. This is obvious then that abortion is, is not wrong because, or sorry, it is obvious that abortion is wrong because, you know, our, all our textbooks say that life begins at conception, and obviously it's wrong to kill. So the kind of this general line of, well, the debate's over, kind of assumes that this argument is correct, that abortion ends a life, therefore it's wrong. Uh, there are a lot of problems with this. Let's start off with the main one, that there are plenty of things that are technically in a biological sense alive, and it's not wrong to kill them. So we'll say mold, bacteria, skin cells that you may have in a petri dish, mosquitoes, etc. There are a lot of things that are biologically alive that it's not wrong to kill. And in some senses, and in some cases, it actually is good to kill them. So in the case of some bacteria, uh, and whether or not you think viruses are alive, most virologists don't think they are. But say bacteria, sometimes it's it's right, it's good to kill those. Sometimes it's actually good to kill things that are biologically alive. But all we need for this argument is to say that uh, it's not generally or not always wrong to kill things that are biologically alive. Sometimes you'll give this kind of argument to people and they'll just say, well, yes, but a fetuses are alive in a more in a different sense. And that that's fine. You know, you can, but they obviously are not understanding how undercutting the feeders work. So you can't use this premise that all things that are biologically alive are wrong to kill. It's just a flatly false premise. So um, there's kind of a, a general irritation of pro-life advocates and the whole citing textbooks thing. There's also a, a lecture on embryology. I'll, I'll uh, link at the end of this talk on, on that as well. Um, so another one, kind of what we covered in the question begging section, abortion is murder or abortion kills babies. These are separate points in the book. I lumped them together here. So as, as we kind of previously covered, this is just question begging for one thing, calling it murder assumes it's wrong and saying abortion kills babies also promotes this kind of false idea that there are no, just absolutely no morally relevant differences between embryos or fetuses and completely developed infants, babies, children, what have you. So people will say this a lot. Um, 
but it's just it's just wrong because again it's question begging and kind of operates on some false assumptions. Uh, the other another point that is sometimes made is that abortion kills innocent beings. So uh, the more important thing to note here is that innocence kind of seems to be something we only attribute to beings that are capable of doing wrong, or at least capable of uh, do doing right or wrong, or choosing between right or wrong, and only choose to do right or uh, refrain from doing wrong. Uh, this is not really something that we apply to things that have no agency. So again, are, are rocks innocent? Doesn't seem so, not in any meaningful sense. Now this is of course not saying that fetuses are somehow uh, guilty at conception. Of course, maybe if you're a Christian who believes in original sin, you'll say that they are, in which case you can't really accept this premise then, can you? But um, in any sense, this isn't to say that fetuses are guilty on most conceptions. It's just to say that the concepts of guilt and innocence don't apply to them at all in the same way they don't apply to your appendix or a rock or a tree. Uh, another argument is that the Bible says abortion is wrong. I'm seeing the typo there where I some, for some reason put a capital I. Pre apologize. Um, <laughs> I've been working on this a while, so I've made some mistakes. Um, this is a, this is kind of one of those arguments. It's, it's not really worth entertaining as a serious argument in, in applied ethics, bioethics, or for any moral conclusion. And this is because there are a lot of more prescriptions in the Bible we can find for bad things. I did it again with the eye. I don't know what my keyboard was doing there. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but so there are, there are a lot of, you can find moral prescriptions in the Bible for a lot of things, a lot of normative assumptions, uh, normative prescriptions that are wrong, you know, things about slavery or uh, sexism. So th there's a lot, and you can kind of find Bible verses to support anything, so that's one reason this is not worth taking seriously, but also there are a couple other reasons this isn't really a serious or good argument. For one, it's not really clear that the Bible ever actually explicitly talks about abortion. Uh, for another thing, you know, this is an argument that's only going to be relevant to people that accept the Bible as some sort of moral kind of guidebook, which not, which of course any non-Christian is not going to accept, but even some Christians who are not biblical inerrantists are not going to accept that. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of reasons. And also, finally, it, even if the Bible says it's wrong, this doesn't entail really any interesting conclusions, at least directly about you know, legislation or even morality in some senses, but more, more importantly, legislation. So this is not really an argument that's actually on the table in any serious discussion about this issue, but it's worth pointing out because it's such a common one. Uh, but even for Christians, this should not be an argument that's accepted as, as worth taking seriously. There's also people that say kind of things along these lines, like abortion stops a beating heart. And again, this is something that it's kind of a weird, vague thing that's thrown out there. Um, there are a lot of things that were, there's at least one thing. So think about open heart surgery. Sometimes you have to stop a heart in a medical procedure in order to make some, do some operation, then restart it. So th just the act of itself of stopping a beating heart is, is not really anything morally interesting. There's also, of course, the cases of brain dead people that have technically beating hearts because they're on life support and, okay, it's usually fine to kill them, or at least we think so, or at least I think so. So that's not really something that interesting is either. Uh, there was also some bad everyday arguments to hear for abortion, so the one that women can do whatever they want with their bodies. So there are arguments for bodily autonomy, which we'll cover uh, later in the video, but there are obvious limits to autonomy in ethics and moral considerations. So. Uh, of course, women can't do whatever they want with their bodies, you know, taken extremely broadly. They can't use their body to, you know, shoot somebody else in the face on the street uh, and other things like that we can think of that are just absurd. So there are limits to autonomy. We can't do whatever we want with our bodies. So if if it is true, in fact, that, the, um, you know, abortions are something that's seriously morally wrong and maybe something that doesn't just affect a woman's body, well, then there may be a case to be made that this is not. So this is not a good argument just as it stands. The more sophisticated version of the bodily autonomy arguments we'll talk about in a minute are better. Uh, there's also some people who will just say that pro-lifers just want to control women. And for one thing, it's not clear that this is even true. There are a lot of people that are genuinely think abortion is a moral evil. Um, and also, it's this isn't really interesting. It's, it's just kind of attributing... Um, things to your opponent without really making an argument as to why the action itself is, is good or bad. So it's not really that great of a consideration, not really interesting. Uh, there's also this thing that men just shouldn't talk about issues that apply only to women. So people, sometimes when these abortion rights things will come up, will just point out that the um, people working in the legislation are all men and they're all making decisions about women's bodies for them and this is wrong. And while there is something to be said for the lived experience of being a woman, just as there's something to say about the lived experience of being a, a certain race um, and, or other considerations, it's just simply false that men can't talk about ethics or, you know, if this is something that's seriously wrong, that men can't have philosophical positions that entail that it is wrong or philosophical arguments. So it, this is not really anything serious either. Of course, men can talk about issues that apply to women and vice versa. Women can talk about issues that apply to men. Um, in the realm of ethics, 
we're talking where we're thinking about arguments and objectivity, not you know the gender of the people involved. Um, so a lot of these arguments are really covered in the prior question begging section. Again, the whole thing about men shouldn't talk. That's again assuming that it's sort of this morally neutral thing that's just up to women and their autonomy. But of course, as we cover, there are limits to that. So there's reasons to think we should think about this more critically and more extended. So these are all basically covered. Let's move on to uh, some more interesting arguments, some philosophical arguments for and against abortion, starting with those against. So starting off with fetuses are human. Now, the interesting thing here, there are lots of things that are human in a biological sense. So human, or similarly to the term life, is a biological category. But there are things that are human biologically they're not going to kill. So if you have biologically alive human cells, you just have in a Petri dish in a lab and you know, killing those, it's not wrong to kill that. It's, you know, there's no harm. Uh, tumors, tumors may be part of your body that may be human tumors in biological sense, or even certain organs, if you need to remove them or kill them, again, such as an appendix, like body parts like that, uh, tumors, cells. There are lots of things that are biologically human, but it's not wrong to kill them. So again, this is a case where the premises aren't going to be acceptable. Uh, one way people might push back on this is to say that fetuses are not just human, but they're human beings. So I guess this could be translatable to human beings or organisms. But again, there are examples of this that are wrong to kill. Now this is this one and the next argument are ones that are going to get us more into the weeds. So uh, just as a as a note, these are going to be more complex and ones that require more consideration. So uh, say human beings that are in a permanent vegetative state, so they're brain dead. They're human beings slash human organisms. They're a collection of, of human organs and and things like that, uh, but they're brain dead. So they are organisms, but it, you know, in what sense is it wrong to kill someone that's not a, not a coma that they may come out of, just permanently brain dead, they're on life support. This is a, a human being, this is a human organism that seems like it's not wrong to kill. If you wanna say that it's wrong to kill those, it's gonna be a really uncomfortable, um, there's really no, no good reason to use resources to keep a body alive that doesn't have any conscious activity. So that's a premise you're not gonna to wanna to accept. Um, another point, point, another important point here is to specify what is it about organisms or beings that make it wrong to kill them. So the proposed account in the book, and one that I'm partially, at least partially attracted to, is that consciousness is a property and conscious experiences are necessary conditions. Maybe not sufficient, but they're necessary for being persons or for having uh, a right to life. And this is because only conscious things can be harmed. At least it seems, it seems very plausible. So there are other accounts contra this position or partially contra this position that want to say that the right to life is essential to all living human organisms at any stage of development. So this is origin essentialism or biological essentialism are two concepts here that are important that, you know, at any stage, human beings or human organisms have the same right to life as at any other stage. Um, so this seems false again when we apply it to the brain dead case. And if it's false in the brain dead case, it seems like we should say it's false for the fetuses that have not yet attained consciousness because there's not a morally relevant difference. You may go with the potential route, we'll cover that in a second. So there are some complex issues here at play with or essentialism. Um, and there is a complex literature on biological essentialism, but the important thing to start off with here is just that it does not seem true that beings or organisms, human beings or organisms are always wrong to kill. So another line people go is that fetuses are persons. This is getting more interesting. Um, so we get to again ask questions for specification. What are persons and what you know when do they develop and what is it about them what is it about personhood that makes that thing wrong to kill so when do persons develop when do they cease to exist so this is important it's like obviously i didn't always exist and i'm a person so there was a state at which i did not exist and there was a state at which i did so there was obviously something different between one stage where there was not a person that was me and the stage in which there was we also have to ask, can I lose my personhood status? And if we think so, we have to have an account of when that happens. There has to be some account of, of when I gain and lose personhood. So it doesn't seem right to say that I'm always at every stage of my biological existence as an organism, a person. That just doesn't seem right. And there are some other you know, psychological considerations here. Also, if, we're, if our premise says something like it's wrong to kill human persons, this is not universally true. There are cases in which it is okay to kill human persons and sometimes even right. There are minimal, I think, minimal cases, but some where in war it's okay, or say self-defense or defense of a loved one. It's obviously not always wrong to kill a human person. So if that premise is going to be universified, uh, then it's, it's not really going to work, at least stated that way. But again, the human being part and the person's part, the potential person, and all the things we're covering here are the more complex parts of the literature. So you're going to need to look. You're going to want to look more into this. Uh, this is an introductory run through of these things, and I'll, I'll some papers later. I'll reference as well some resources. There's another. There's another line of reply that goes that fetuses are maybe they're not persons. They're potential persons because 
when we think about the biology, uh, the philosophical literature on personhood, a lot of times what people say you must have to be a person has something to do with um, capacity for abstract thought or command of language. And maybe there are counterexamples to this, but obviously fetuses before they're conscious, you know, can't speak or really even think, definitely not before they've developed brains. So at least in the first trimester, it's it's going to be really hard to make the case that fetuses are persons on any definition of personhood that makes sense. Again, give me a definition of personhood that includes brain dead people and, and consciousness and fetuses prior to consciousness, and that's going to be a really weird account of personhood. So it was a, you wouldn't go, go the route and say that they're only potential persons. So let's assume that this is true. It's not really clear that anything follows from it because we don't grant rights to things based on what they potentially are, we grant them rights based on what they actually are. So if I'm 20 years old, we don't say I can buy alcohol because I am a person is potentially 21. Uh, we don't, and you know, you can't drive because you're potentially 16 when you're 14. You don't get to be a practicing doctor because you're potentially a doctor while you're an undergraduate going into law school. So it seems like in general, we don't grant people things rights based on what they potentially are. Um, so there's, that's one route of reply. Another one that's a little bit more philosophically complicated is the, there is some reason to doubt that fetuses even are potential persons in any relevant sense. So we're going to talk about this in the next point as well. But the, the best teasing out of this is probably by the philosopher Jeff McMahon, particularly in his book, The Ethics of Killing. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, in terms of psychological disconnectivity. So one popular argument comes from a paper by Don Marquis. So this is that abortion deprives fetuses from having valuable experiences. This is similar to the potential person's route. Um, so similar replies will work. But there's also some reason to doubt that fetuses even have a future like ours due to psychological disconnection or disconnectivity. Um, and this is kind of what McMahon is getting at in his account, which is just that in what sense is a fetus potentially me? I have a certain level of development cognitively. I'm a person. I have consciousness. A fetus doesn't. So there's no psychological connection between a fetus prior to attaining consciousness and me as a person. So McMahon has cast some uh, doubt on the metaphysical assumption that fetuses even are potential persons. He wants to say that they're completely different organisms. And I find this account pretty plausible. It makes more metaphysical sense of personhood and personal persistence. And so this applies to the deprivation case as well. But um, but there is some other reason, even less extreme, to doubt that fetuses have a future like ours. We think about your future and you're planning for next year. Say you want to get married, buy a house, start a new job. Uh, you have some psychological connection to that future as well as to your past. A fetus doesn't have this kind of psychological connection to its future because it doesn't have psychological um, events, psychological perception in that way. So it's not connected to its future in the same way we are. Uh, so there are some reasons to think this argument doesn't work. Also, it seems like Marquis' argument stated a certain way might imply the wrongness of contraception because, you know, uh, a spermazoa and an egg potentially joined, you know, could have certain experiences. But, um, you know, obviously I want to say con contraception is wrong. Uh, there are also some interesting things here to go into when we think about Derek Parfit's repugnant conclusion, but I'm not going to get super into that. I might do a separate video on it. So just as a, as a note at the end here, there's some concepts of essentialism particularly origin essentialism and biological essentialism and the literature on and philosophy on personhood that they're all really relevant here and I can't really go as into the weeds on as it would be necessary to to sufficiently cover this so um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and 1000 Word Philosophy the website I'll link those in the description of this video as well they all have articles dealing with these in an interesting way and especially 1000 Word Philosophy has a couple entries particularly relating to abortion so let's move on to some philosophical arguments for abortion. So we can start off with the assumption that there's not really any good argument that's wrong, given what we've seen so far. If something's wrong, seriously wrong, in a, in a sense in which it should be illegal and obviously immoral, it seems like there'd be pretty strong arguments to the effect that it is wrong. So when we think about cases like, you know, nobody thinks it's right to just walk into someone's house and slaughter their entire family with a knife or to cause mass amounts of suffering for, for no good reason, just for some sort of sensual pleasure, unless you're a strange kind of utilitarian or utilitarian hedonist. Uh, it seems like that when things are obviously morally wrong in a serious sense, there's going to be good and pretty obvious arguments and intuitions we can appeal to. And thus far, it seems like we don't really have great arguments to the effect that abortion is wrong. They don't seem to all work. They seem to have really controversial premises or weird conclusions or weird um, things are gonna commit us to if we accept the premises. Um, so this is one line of reply, but this may assume too much, you know, it may assume we've not looked at all the arguments sufficiently, and it's 
you know, given the context of only the arguments covered in this video and the book and only the depth, uh, it should be something in which we could and should maybe suspect judgment, we should say. Well, maybe there are some arguments that it is wrong that we're not aware of or we've not kind of recognized the implications of certain premises. Uh, maybe we, it just, some people think it's obviously wrong, so maybe we're wrong in our intuitions and we should look more carefully at the premises and developing arguments. So simply to say there's no good argument that is wrong doesn't seem sufficient to say that it's right. Uh, but it's something to consider at least. One argument also given in the book is the harm account to the wrongness of killing. So to say that something, uh, that what makes something wrong to kill is its capacity to be harmed. So when we take into account the features of what makes something wrong to kill, it doesn't seem like the fetuses have these features, at least early on in development. So we kind of want to accept that a thing must be able to experience harm to have a right to life. And if we accept that, it's difficult to see what makes abortion wrong. So obviously there's there's no way, no sense in which you can harm a rock or a tree and really, or your desk or anything, or you just uh, cells. So if we accept then that something has to be harmed to be make it wrong to kill, it's difficult to see what makes abortion wrong in the early stages, because again, how do we build an account of, of harm relevance to something that's not conscious? So we can also go here with the bodily autonomy. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about autonomy. So Thompson's violinist argument. So the classic argument, which I'll link a good video on, goes something like this. Say you wake up in a hospital, you're plugged into a famous violinist, you've been kidnapped, and he needs your kidneys. He needs to be attached to your kidneys to filter through to keep him alive. So if you unplug from the violinist, the violinist will die. Uh, and you've been kidnapped and put there by the Society of Music Lovers because they want to keep this guy alive. So you have to stay plugged into him to keep him alive. If you unplug yourself, he will die. And it seems like we want to say that you have the right to unplug yourself. You, just because you were kidnapped and put here and just because this person will die without you doesn't mean you are compelled to stay plugged into them. That's an obvious violation of your bodily autonomy and rights. So famously, Judith Jarvis Thompson argues that given this case, even if fetuses are persons with the right to life, so say we grant a lot of controversial assumptions, we can still make the argument that persons do not have the right to use another person's body without their consent. So there's Thompson, and there's, a, there's court cases that back up this kind of intuition as well. So the McFall versus Shimp case, where a judge determined that you can't demand a family member uh, use, you know, demand that a family use your bone marrow, say in a, in a medical procedure to keep you alive. You can't force a family member or another person to give up their bodily autonomy to keep you alive. So this seems to support Thompson's case in a sense. Some say that there's a distinction here between killing and letting die. I'm not quite sure that that's really irrelevant. And we can also think of um, cases in which it's okay to kill, like actively and positively kill in order to maintain your bodily autonomy. So say you're put in a cage and it's locked and your captor, and you've been kept there for days, your captor comes to give you food. Well, you stab him with some shiv you've made and escape. So this is a case in which you've actively killed another human person, but it seems like it's right for you to do this, to protect your bodily autonomy, and you've actively killed instead of just merely let something die. So even if you assume that the killing versus letting die distinction is as morally relevant as some people think it is, it's not quite clear that there are not. It's, it seems that there are cases where killing actively uh, is okay to preserve bodily autonomy as well. Some people want to say that women consent to pregnancy by the very act of having sex at all, even if it's protected on birth control, because they know there's a small chance this may result in pregnancy, so they've already consented to being pregnant. So they've already consented to this, it's not they've been kidnapped, so this analogy doesn't work. Uh, this seems obviously wrong for a number of reasons. For one, there are rape cases, which we'll cover, uh, and although they may be small, they're there. But also, it's we take risks a lot of times in life, and that doesn't mean we always consent to bad things happening as a result of that. So again, say I leave my front door unlocked, and a murderer walks in, uh, it's <laughs> it's not clear, and in fact, it seems flatly false that they have a right to be in my house, even though, and I cons it also seems false that I consented to them being in my house, even though, of course, you know that if you leave your front door or your house unlocked, there's a small chance someone could walk in. You don't think it's going to happen, but you know deep down that there's a, there's a possibility, there's a small possibility. So I knew when I left my front door unlocked that there was a small possibility someone would walk in, and a murderer walks in. It, again, they don't have the right to be there, and I've not consented to them being there, staying in my house, and then using the resources of my house in some way, just because I you know, made a decision that I knew possibly could have these consequences doesn't mean I've consented to the extent of the consequences. So this doesn't really follow, and this is a common argument people make against women and against women having abortions, and it's, it's kind of made in bad faith and just seems like it's pretty clearly a bad argument. 
So there are some other concerns that get us more into the weeds. So there are rape cases and there are late term abortions. People say, okay, we'll say I agree with you that most abortions aren't wrong. You know, 90% of them are first trimester, maybe bleeding a little bit into the second, but almost always before we have any sort of development of consciousness or even pain, nervous system, what have you. But there are cases, say, in the you know, third, third trimester when a, a fetuses pretty clearly are conscious that they're killed. So when is this? So um, again, this is going to, you're going to have to look more at the statistics on this one. But again, 90% of abortions are the first trimester and a lot of them after that are second. So the ones that are very late in pregnancies are almost always due to severe medical complications that are you know, threatening the mother's life or complicating the pregnancy in some way. So it's not like, you know, women just wait till the last second. In most cases, again, you'll have to look at some of the sources I've cited thus far and will at the end. Um, the statistics on this show that almost any late-term abortion is due to some just horrible, horrible uh, complication with the pregnancy, that if the abortion's not carried out, uh, there's going to be horrible consequences for the woman. So, again, you have to look more into the st statistics and science on that, but when some states, you know, legalize abortion up to the ninth month, it's because of these crazy complications. There are also the issue of what rape cases, which may be small, but a lot of people that are pro-life do seem to sometimes concede that when a woman's raped, uh, they should be able to have an abortion. But this seems kind of in tension with their some of their other arguments and insistence on personhood. Obviously, uh, just because something bad was done to you doesn't mean you can kill another person. So they have the moral, um, kind of at least the moral intuition that it's wrong to force a woman to you know carry a pregnancy to term once they've been raped. But this also seems inconsistent with some of their other views, but at least they have the moral compassion to recognize this. Uh, so it seems like rape cases of abortion, we should definitely, because the, uh, the kind of the consent argument definitely doesn't work there. And again, even if you think late-term abortions are long, wrong and should be illegal, you can still say that uh, most abortions aren't wrong. So it's the subtitle of this book, actually, is that most abortions aren't wrong and all, why most abortions aren't wrong and why all should be legal. So there's a case for legality to be made in the, in the sense that women, it should be illegal for women to terminate pregnancies if they're causing serious endangerment to their life and have serious complications in the third trimester. So a couple notes on those cases, but there's a lot more to say and a lot more science. Again, I'd look uh, Scientific American and um, the sources I cited earlier on the science and statistics of why abortions happen, and that, that's useful to look into. And the, of course, the Center for Disease Control. So... To conclude or begin concluding, these kinds of issues are really, really complex. They require a lot of honest, critical thinking if we're going to have any sort of productive dialogue or discussion or progress morally. I hope this video can help you begin to think more critically about abortion and the issues surrounding it. Uh, so we should all be able to agree in a sense that reducing the number of abortions is a good idea. So even if you're pro-choice and think it's in general not wrong to have an abortion, we still want less because it doesn't seem like a great use of resources. And a lot of times the people, reasons people are having abortions are due to economic stress of some sense. So we don't want abortions occurring simply because people actually don't have a choice. If we're going to be pro-choice, we should be actually pro-choice. And if, if you're being forced into having an abortion because of economic stress, well, then that's not a choice in any meaningful sense of the word. So we should all be able to agree that reducing the number of abortions is a good idea. The debate then shifts to what's the best way to accomplish that. And it seems like uh, more economic safety nets and other in social social help and um, things like that are going to be the better way rather than just making it illegal and there's statistics to back this up as well but that's not the scope of this video so i'd also like to say that this is an overview of just the very basics of the issue so before taking a strong position either way or getting into a huge argument with me in the youtube comments it would be good for you to study more of the philosophical resources surrounding this topic i've tried to have arguments or discussions rather with people on this before who just are completely unfamiliar with the introductory literature and it's mind-numbing because they don't understand how undercutting defeaters work or how these premises operate. Um, so it's good to just kind of be generally informed before taking a super strong position either way. A lot of people that are super strongly pro-choice have, have never cracked a book on this and vice and you know the same for most people who are pro-choice. If we're going to have good dialogue about this people need to be educated on it. So I'd encourage that before taking a strong position or arguing with people about a strong position even if you have a moral intuition that suggests you have a strong position. So in the next slide here, we're going to have some recommendations. Uh, all the Some of the scientific stuff, again, Scientific American, Gutmacher, Center for Disease Control, in the previous slides are good to look at for, you know, the facts about fetal consciousness, fetal pain, the whys, the, the what's, and the process, and the science, uh, the science versus podcast, again, is very good on this. So the starting recommended resource, though, for the philosophy is the very book that was the source text for this video, Thinking Critically About Abortion by Nathan Nobis and Christina Grob. Grob whatever, either way. <laughs> so um, I use this as the source text again. It's very short. It's about 50 pages. It only takes about two hours or less to read. 
and it's very good, very good introduction. It's free online. I'll link in the description in PDF form. But if you'd like to support the authors, uh, please buy it on Amazon. It's like five dollars. Leave them a good review. And so the next thing is a good book, A Defense of Abortion by David Boonin. Uh, there's also so in the earlier what I was talking about in the whole life begins at conception arguments. There's a Yale biology lecture from one of Yale's uh, leading scientists on medicinal studies and embryology. There's a lecture on embryology called Biology and History of Abortion. He goes through some of these issues and gives an evolutionary account uh, and argues actually that life doesn't begin at conception in the meaningful sense that some people say. So that's a good video. And he addresses all of my textbooks as arguments. So it's good to look at that. Um, if you want a pro-life perspective and a book kind of overviewing, there's a book by a pretty big pro-life philosopher named Christopher Kazkor, just called The Ethics of Abortion. So good introduction to the pro-life perspective on this you can find on Amazon. Probably the best resource on the list, the best book, is The Ethics of Killing by Jeff McMahon, where he gives an extended psychological connectivity account of the wrongness of killing and talks about abortion, euthanasia, all kinds of instances of killing that are, are at the kind of the fringes or the, the edge of life. And then for a really compelling and creative introduction and exposition of Thompson's violinist argument, there's a YouTube video uh, by Philosophy Tube called Abortion and Ben Shapiro. That's very good. I've watched it multiple times now. Uh, again, it's very creative, very clever, and rather compelling. Uh, it's done very well. And then the article I mentioned earlier, Abortion and the Left by Current Affairs magazine, free available online, talks about the statistics, the economic factors, and how people on the left should and, you know, how the pro-life cause should be more left-leaning, more egalitarian, and this will actually reduce the number of abortions. So those are some good introductory resources. There's a lot more that you could use, but those are just a couple that I found helpful and liked and, you know, think would be good to recommend. So all that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, you know, the general generic YouTuber send-off. But again, yeah, um, definitely look into the issue some more if you're interested, and if you would like further videos on this, maybe going for more of a deep dive, uh, let me know, and I can I can make further videos on this, maybe on the just the essentialism question, which interests me more. But in any case, I hope you've enjoyed the video, and um, yeah, have a good one.